Hi, my name is Kanwal Sarai, and welcome to the Simply Investing Dividend Podcast. This episode is a continuation of my interview with Ben, the founder of Sure Dividend. In part one, you learned how Ben got started in dividend investing, his first investment in a mutual fund, and how he's investing in today's economic climate. In this episode, part two, you'll see what Ben looks for in a dividend stock, how he focuses on risk and return, his two worst investments, and using dividends as a margin of safety. Let's get started with part two right now. Now, are there certain things, uh, Ben, that you look for when you're evaluating uh, a company before you invest in it? What are kind of some of the things that you're looking for to help event your, you are, at the end of the day, you want to minimize your risk yes. before you invest in anything. So what do, what do you look for? So the approach we take at Sure Dividend is we, I mean, we, we focus on two different sides, the, the return and the risk. So on the return side, we have an expected total return framework, which is, I guess, a, I don't know if it's fancy, but a fancy way to say like all returns come from either uh, your dividends, which is pretty obvious, or the share price going up, which is, or down, which is pretty obvious too. And the share price changing only comes from two sources, either your, and this is simplified, like, you know, you could use different numbers or different things here, but either comes from the earnings per share changing or from the price earnings ratio changing. So on the, the return side, we look for, you know, in a perfect world, we, we want a company who's growing their earnings quickly, who has a price to earnings ratio that looks really low for what it should be. And, you know, that's, there's a whole art to that of what should it be. Um, but all other things being equal, the lower the price earnings ratio, the better. And then the higher the dividend yield, the better. All other things being equal, of course, you know, a, a 10% dividend yield is, there's probably something wrong there. Um, but if, if there wasn't, we'd love it. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's on the return side. And then on the risk side, which you were mentioning, we, we, we have a dividend risk score, but it's really, we're looking at the payout ratio. Uh, you know, again, everything else the same, the lower, the better for safety. So the pay ratio is just the percentage of earnings paid out as dividends. So if a company is paying out, uh, 95% of their earnings as dividends, a little dip in their earnings and they can't support their dividend anymore. So that's very yeah. risky. Whereas a company that's paying out 30% of their earnings as dividends, they can have a huge drop in earnings and, and still cover their dividend. No problem. Uh, and then as we've discussed. A, a dividend history is important to us too. The longer, the better there, because that shows that uh, it's ingrained in the company's culture and in the management to prioritize the dividend. So those are those are the the risk and return side, and then also kind of in between those, which you can't really, you know, I guess it shows up somewhat in numbers, but not as much would be things like competitive advantage and just qualitatively, like what do we think about this company? Um, and that actually is reflected somewhat in the dividend history as well, uh, as we've talked about, you know, 50 years of rising dividends, that company probably has a pretty strong ability to protect itself somehow, or at least it did up until very recently, <laughs> you know, no, nothing's guaranteed, but, yep. uh, it, it's, it's a good sign. Um, so those are things we look for, uh, in, in selecting dividend stocks. Yeah. Those are all good things. I mean, that's, you want to do your homework. You don't want, the worst thing you can do is blindly pick stocks to invest in. <laughs> That's the worst thing you want to do. And I've done that before. That's how I got started. And then it's the worst thing you can do. Um, so I like everything you've mentioned in there is you're looking for good quality dividend stocks to invest in, and that's going to minimize your risk, right? You're not going to get into a company that has a payout ratio of 150%. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, exactly. Because because <laughs> you see that and you're like, well, okay, they cannot pay their dividend. And I don't want to gamble on them doubling their earnings next year. Like, that's not a great bet. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's something we would avoid. Whereas the opposite, you see a low payout ratio and a decent yield. And you're like, okay, well, this is pretty likely to probably rise over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's something you mentioned, uh, and I think we just kind of mentioned it quickly. He said, well, if the dividend yield was 10%, you know, that would be something that would be interesting. 
what I, what I'm seeing now is as, as stock prices are coming down, there's some stocks where you look at the yield and it's like 24% yield. You're like, how can this, how is this even possible? So do you want to talk a little bit about in the business, we call it a dividend trap. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so tell our audience, what is a dividend trap and why it's a, it's a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. So if you're using a stock screener and you sort by dividend yield, you'll see these companies. And like, oh my, like you said, oh my gosh, a 24% dividend yield. You know, I'm putting all my portfolio into it. I'll think how rich I'll get. I'll get paid back my full investment every four years. Uh, things that are look too good to be true usually are. Um, in most of those cases, that dividend yield is not real. They've either already cut their dividend and the screener just hasn't picked it up or they're about to. Um, there's virtually, the dividend yield is only that high because the share price has fallen tremendously. Um, and there's usually a good reason for that. The stock market's not dumb, like it's, it's, it's signaling something. So a dividend trap is a company that is about to cut its dividend and it looks appealing on a quick glance basis. But when you, when you dig into it, you realize you're, you're probably going to see a big dividend cut and see the money you put into it get, uh, you know, decline significantly. Yeah, that's a, that's a big one. And I like what you said there. If the yield is too good to be true, it probably is. <laughs> um, it's yeah. It, you look at it and you're like, what? 24% yield. Why would I make 2% yield when I can make 24%? I'll put all my money in there. <laughs> right. And then you're just asking for trouble. And uh, I'll share this. I've done this before on my other uh, episodes, uh, but I'll, I want to share quickly with the audience uh, a personal story of mine. So I don't know if you remember Washington Mutual. So this is before 2008. Um, so they were a big, the big bank in the US that had been around since the 1800s. Their yield went up to maybe it was 9.8 or 10%. So I'm looking at a 10% yield. And I'm thinking to myself, what's the worst that can happen? Even if they cut the dividend in half, I'll make 5%. Um, I ignored everything we talked about before. So I didn't look at the payout ratio. I didn't look at the earnings. didn't look at the dividend history. didn't look at anything. And uh, anyway, we won't get into the details. If someone, someone suggested it to me. I got a text message saying, hey, you should take a look at Washington Mutual. 10% is an awesome yield. And I bought it the same day. I think I put $5,000 into that company. Same day. Didn't look at any, didn't do any homework. And I just bought it because the yield was amazing. Within 12 to 14 months, the company was bankrupt and it was gone. And I lost the entire 5,000. The shares were worth zero. And there were, there's no dividend, obviously, because they're gone bankrupt. <laughs> That's, I, I recognize, did, did, uh, JP Morgan buy them out of bankruptcy? I'm trying no, to think No, no, they were not saved. Washington Mutual oh, was just, not saved. They just went fully, fully away. Yeah, fully away. Okay. Yeah. Uh, nice. I know there was another one that, that was saved. Somebody, uh, yeah, JP, so JP Morgan or someone invested in them to keep them, uh, keep them afloat. Uh, but okay. Washington Mutual wasn't one of them. That's, you so, don't see him anymore. <laughs> so I'm hoping people will learn from my mistake uh, and not make uh, the same uh, mistake again. Now, Ben, do you have any sort of share a story that you bought a stock that you regretted? <laughs> I have too. I have a a non dividend stock story and a probably our worst or one of our worst share dividend investment stories. So okay. I'll do the non dividend okay. stock okay. one first. So this is when I was first learning about investing and I was, you know, I was like, oh, I'm a value investor. I'm going to get those super low P to E ratio stocks. And I'm, you know, no one knows how to do, no one's this, smart. no one knows how to do this, um, which is like the easiest thing to do. You just, you know, stock screener. And so I'm like, oh, look, this one has a price earnings ratio of two or something like that. And it was a, one of those, um, it's like a, I forget what they call them, but they're, they listed on in U.S. exchanges in a kind of murky way as one of the Chinese like reverse merger companies, mm -hmm. um, which I didn't know anything about. That I was just like, okay, this is great. It's so cheap. I'm gonna I'm gonna win. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I and I bought it, and I, I pretty quickly it declined significantly. And I was started looking into it, and then it was like, oh, they probably don't even have any factories or any of the things they said. It's just basically a scam. Mm. Um, so I learned a lesson there that you know. 
again, the, it, it looked way too good to be true. Um, and what did I know about investing in a reverse merger Chinese stock? Um, I didn't know anything about it. Yeah. I just, I just knew P to E of, you know, two or whatever was, was great. Cause I read a study that price earnings ratios that are low mean good returns. Um, it's not always true, <laughs> especially not when <laughs> you're looking at one stock. So that's a story of an investment personally that I really messed up that I, I learned from. Um, one of the worst sure dividend investments, and it's especially painful because it recovered, but we, we had sold out of it uh, as a mm. company called Owens and Minor. Um, they're a pharmaceutical distributor, medical supplies distributor, not one of the big three. They're a smaller one. They had a 24, 25 year dividend history when we recommended them. They look cheap, but not like, you know, insane cheap, just like from memory, maybe like a PDE of 10, like a solid 3% yield, something like that. It's like, this looks like a solid company. Um, they had recently done some acquisitions and had, had some debt. Um, we, we thought it'd be okay. They ended up having a business decline too, too much debt kind of looked like they were going bankrupt. They, they cut their dividend, their share price went from 30 to like, I want to say below three or something. We recommended selling when they cut their dividend at a, a huge loss. Um, and then they recovered <laughs> and their share price got back to 30 <laughs> or so, like a few years later. Um, mm -hmm. which made it even more painful to see mm -hmm. that, you know, we just how that one worked out. And the lesson we took from that one is if we would have done more of a cash flow analysis, uh, you would have seen the cash flows had deteriorated enough that it looked riskier on the cash flow side than it did on the earnings side. Um, and, and that's a, a, an important thing to look at too, is, is cash flows, not just earnings. Um, but that was one of our, our worst dividend investments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's uh, thank you for sharing uh, your story with uh, both of those stocks. Um, I'm sure this is helpful for the listeners to, to, to learn from those uh, mistakes, right? And, and hopefully not <laughs> run into the same problems we did. Now, you mentioned a good, uh, good point, though, with the, uh, the most recent, uh, the last uh, stock that you were talking about. And here's what I tell my clients. You know, it's, 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 it's difficult because what we're doing as investors is we're going based on public information, the financial statements, right? And you'll remember in the case of Enron, I guess they weren't completely truthful about what they were putting in their financial statements. <laughs> um, and so there's no way for us outsiders to know anything about what's really going on in the company. So I tell my clients, just be prepared. Over your investing career, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you're going to get maybe two, maybe three companies that are just going to tank, right? You've done your homework. At the time, it looked like a good, it was a good decision, but it just collapsed for some reason or another. Um, the good news is we always tell people to build a diversified portfolio of stocks, of dividend stocks. So you've got different industries in there, different sectors in there, and they're paying dividends. And so your dividend income that's being generated by the portfolio should hopefully go up over time. Even if you do get one or two of those disasters, uh, one of them for me is GE. <laughs> so, um, I think people have heard of what's going on with GE. So I still own GE in hindsight. Maybe I should have gotten rid of it after their numerous dividend cuts that they had, uh, over the last five, six years. Um, but anyway, we'll see how that goes. But I think it's good to be prepared. You, know, you may end up with one of these stocks that tank, or you may not, and you'd be lucky and you'd be fine with it. But as long as you're prepared, you're good to go. And I think, Ben, you'll agree that every time a dividend is paid or every time a dividend is increased, your risk goes down. Like that's almost your margin of safety, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I agree. And you could think about it like you can you can never have a total loss of capital if you're getting dividends. You can't you can't really go to zero because you've been paid um, something, which is is nice to have that at least. Um, yes, there certainly is a margin of safety there, in knowing that you're getting paid something. And I wanted to touch on your your points about diversification, which are really well said, but it's it's so important, and everyone is going to have have misses in their portfolio. You can't get every stock right. It's impossible. 
the world's uncertain and, you know, you have no idea what's going to happen. Like, you know, 2020, um, a lot of REITs did really poorly and you can't blame them. Like the, the whole world shut down. People weren't mm-hmm. allowed to go into stores. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, you have to be prepared for that by being diversified, uh, in different companies and different industries and sectors. Like you said, that's extremely important to not put all your eggs in one basket. Um, and, and yeah, to, to have different holdings. And I, I would like to hear your thoughts on what do you, what are your thoughts on the number of holdings that someone should have as far as individual stocks go? I don't think there's uh, a consensus <laughs> answer here, but <laughs> yeah, there isn't. That's a great question. And I spent a lot of time researching, um, reading what other investors are doing and what they're suggesting. And if you read some of the books from the eighties, early, uh, late, uh, you know, early nineties, I think the consensus at the time, and again, maybe I should rephrase that it wasn't a consensus, but a lot of folks are saying, well, 20, 25 stocks, that's all you really need in your portfolio. You're good to go. My answer is, I think you can go up to 40, 45 nowadays. Why? Because we have Microsoft Excel, we have spreadsheets, we have Google Sheets. Uh, we have apps now where you can track your portfolio and you can see immediately when there is a dividend increase, when there's a dividend cut. So it's easier for me using the technologies we have today that I can comfortably track 40, 45 stocks on average and I'm fine. I think if you're doing it with pen and paper, maybe in, back in those days in the 70s and 80s, it was 25 stocks was good enough. Uh, but I'm going to stick with my answer there, 44, 45. What do you think, Ben? How much, how many stocks should somebody own? Um, first of all, I, I hadn't heard that point about it's easier to track stocks now than 20 years ago or 30 years ago, which is really interesting. And I agree with it is easier now. Um, I'd never thought of that before. I, I am in the 20 to 30 camp. Um, hmm. I think it's a good mix between concentration in your best ideas and diversification. Um, just the, the more holdings, the each incremental additional holding gives you less diversification benefits than the previous one. So the gains of diversification from going from one stock to two is huge. From 99 to 100 is, you know, basically non-existent. Um, so I like 20 to 30, um, probably personally more on the lower end of that uh, to, to have that concentration without too much concentration, where if, if one company went completely south, you know, if it went to zero tomorrow, you'd lose 5%. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't be permanently sunk. Um, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, you you do well if some of your companies have substantial growth. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the one thing we, I mean, the quantity, sure. 25, 30, 35, 40, what that's fine. I think we'll agree that we don't want people out there building a portfolio of 200 stocks. <laughs> oh yeah. You can't track it. There's no way. <laughs> Absolutely. That's it. Very difficult to track. And then at that point, they're not all going to be, we talked about looking at pay payout ratios, making sure the PE is good. You know, you're not going to get those kinds of quality companies when you've got a, a basket of 200 stocks in there. There's oh, going to be some, some losers in there. Yeah. I completely agree. And and on the, the other end of the extreme, I, I would also really not want anyone to go the Charlie Munger approach of I own three stocks. Yes. <laughs> Unless don't you're do Charlie that. Munger. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Unless you're Charlie, don't do that. <laughs> if, if you've put in 70 years of really great uh, stock picking history, then I say go for th- your three stock holdings. Um, three, <laughs> but if you don't have that uh, 50 plus year history, then, then steer clear. Yeah. Then steer clear of that. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Ben, tell us a little bit about why you started uh, Sure Dividend and what do you do at Sure Dividend? Absolutely. So we've touched on a lot of the the points um, of dividend investing in general, and that's why I started Sure Dividend. I was looking at investing and I was thinking, what is, I don't want to say the best way, because I think there's a lot of, it depends who you are, what the best way for you to invest is, but what's a very good way for an individual investor to invest. And I love the, 
I didn't go into it as a dividend investor, dividend growth investor. But when I started learning about studying all the different types of approaches and different market anomalies, I, I loved the dividend growth approach because it combined very low fees because you're you have a long term mindset. You're investing in quality companies because you want the dividend. So like there's a a good reason you're you have that business owner mentality again because the dividends. Um, so everything like lined up with it of, oh, I, I forgot to add, and it's, it's easier to do than to be like a, a growth investor in small caps. There's at the end of the day, it's harder to really screw up a dividend growth strategy when you're buying these quality blue chip companies, you might have some misses, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna see your portfolio go down 90%. Like you could, if you were doing like a a Kathy Wood style of investing as an example. Um, yeah, absolutely. I agree. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it, there was so much that appealed to me as an individual investor. And that I thought this is a really great approach for individual investors. And on top of all that, it's you're investing for income for retirement. Like that's the purpose of investing is to, mm -hmm. to have your income exceed your expenses. And these, these pay you income. You don't have to get fancy and be like, well, I'm going to liquidate 4% a year, but that'll be bad in recessions, but it'll be great if the, you know, you don't have to think about any of that. You're just like, I get dividends and that needs to cover my expenses. It's, there's beauty in that simplicity. Um, so that's what attracted me to this approach. And then we started with a news with a sure dividend newsletter. And I, I was attracted to the newsletter approach, uh, because it's a, it's a very low cost way for investors to get this quality information. Um, you're not paying a 1% a year fee and I don't want to, you know, hate on investment advisors. They, they do provide a valuable service, but some people are better off managing their funds themselves because it's very doable. Um, and, and I think this approach is really tailored to people who want to do it themselves. So, it's so a long explanation, but that's, that's a, <laughs> Why is, why I started share dividend and what what um why I like the strategy. Yeah, no, that's uh that's great. And uh I've seen your reports, uh gone through them. There's a lot of detail, a lot of research uh, and time and effort goes into those reports. And so I think it's a valuable service that you're offering uh to people out there because it saves them time, right? They don't have to start from scratch to try and figure out, okay, what do I what should I invest in? What's out there? Um, so uh, that's really good. Uh, where can people uh, find you then online? Where are you on social media or on your website? Where's the best place to find you? Uh, the best place is suredividend.com. That's that's our website. We have social media, but we don't. That's not the best place to find us. We don't put a lot of uh, thought into that. Uh, our our website and our our email. If you we we have a lot of. Um, Spreadsheets, like you can download the Dividend Aristocrat spreadsheet. Uh, we update it daily. Um, that's where you'll find most of our work. We have a lot of free content that we do. Uh, and then we have our premium services as well. So that that's all on Sure Dividend. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. So uh, I'm going to recommend to everyone, go check out uh, Ben's website, SureDividend.com. Thank you, Ben, for sharing your time, your knowledge, and your insights with us today. That was, I'm sure it's very helpful and beneficial to all of our audience and uh, for chatting about dividend stocks with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being on our podcast, Ben. Thank you. Really. Thank you for having me. Really happy to be here. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any future episodes. Also click on the like button as well. For more information on dividend investing, check out our website, Simply Investing. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.